and we're here with Jens Lundgren at the IAS, the International Conference on AIDS. And uh, he is, Jens Lundgren is a professor at the University of Copenhagen. And you have some data that you've analyzed out of the SMART study, and which will talk to the issues around Nabokovir. And describe that for us. Sure. So we were curious after we uh, completed our analysis in, of the DAD study to examine whether the excess risk of cardiovascular disease that we observed in DAD could be reproduced in other data sets. Uh, so we went into the smart data set, analyzed it there, and found essentially the same association as we found in DAD. Additionally, uh, we try to understand more precisely what the biological mechanisms may be for why this should be this way, uh, and found some uh, intriguing uh, associations that that, that at least suggests that, that one possible mechanism could be that, that the drug is not per se affecting the underlying atherosclerotic process. So that's the, the process in the body that leads to cardiovascular disease normally. So, so, so it's not affecting that process, but, but for patients who already have atherosclerosis that you can have for many years without feeling it, you, you increase this the drug increases the chance that that atherosclerosis manifests itself as a, as a cardiovascular disease. So it increases the propensity for already existing atherosclerosis to manifest itself uh, clinically. So is this, do you have a, a knowledge of whether this is increasing or changing the plaque formation? Or no, it, it doesn't look like it is changing it, but it, it is uh, making the plaques more unstable. Uh, and as a consequence, they are more easy to burst. Uh, but but it is not, uh, and it's and, and it looks like this is only an issue as long as you are on the drug. So as soon as you go off the drug, that that increased propensities goes away. And it probably, at least our data suggests that that it, that this may be explained by the fact that the drug may be inflammatory. So it induces a inflammatory reaction in the coronary artery wall that leads to instability of the plaque, so they are more easy to burst, as long as you are on the drug. So once you go off the drug, that, 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 that problem goes away. Is there any uh, co-relationship with any other drug use, or have you established that with any other Drug that you might on a, on a on a heart regimen, as it could it be? No, it's it, it the, the, it's the, specific the, to it's specific to a back of the, It's um, we've identified an issue with protease inhibitors, but that's a very different issue. Uh, that we think that the protease inhibitors, at least some of them, we're still looking into that, are affecting the the underlying athros atherosclerotic but process. But in a different way. In a different way. Uh, so so this is a, a rather unique uh, example of an adverse effect. Um, in principle, this may be the same situation that led to other drugs that we have heard about, have nothing to do with HIV, that also increases the propensity. Uh, so, 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 uh, so this is not unique in the sense uh, of a back of it being the only drug that may have this problem, but it's the only HIV drugs. Uh, so, Jens, what we're going to do is now I have another colleague who wants to ask you a few more questions, so we're going to turn it over to him. We'll cut for a moment and then turn it over to, to Simon. Very good, thank you. Okay, Jens, it's uh, really good to talk to you about some of the data you've got. Uh, one of the responses to the DAD study back in February was, is, was that uh, people were generally looking for supportive evidence because this was such an unusual finding, uh, supportive evidence from other uh, research. And uh, one of the most important uh, studies, I think, being presented at the IAS conference in Mexico uh, is an analysis from the, the large SMART study uh, which has found um, evidence that supports the DAD findings. That's, uh, that's very true. I, it, it's exactly the same result uh, that, uh, in, in SMART that we uh, already observed in DAD. Um, so this is a really significant finding? Well, it at least uh, shows that we're able to reproduce what we already saw in one study, which of course is important in terms of providing further credence that this was not a, a fluke finding, this was actually uh, a real finding. Uh, and, and it's quite confusing as uh, re reporting this data in some ways, because 
you get evidence coming and you get uh, uh, you get different uh, takes on on the, the, the findings that we, we found in the DAD study. Um, GSK have been fairly vocal in, in presenting the data they have, and and it's been confusing for me because uh, and frustrating because it's almost presented as if the two types of research are equal and they could balance each other. And for me, I think the DAD is is in a very special position because it was set up and has been running for seven years specifically looking at this question. And certainly I would say that DAD ha was set up for this particular purpose. Uh, and you know, evaluating the events as they progressed, uh, and everybody was tuned in to looking at the events, and which is not necessarily so in other studies that has been reported. Uh, furthermore, I think it is uh, important to say that, <clears throat> given what we now uh, understand of what we think are the mechanism of action of this of this adverse event, we only would expect this to be observed in patients with already high underlying risk of cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. So if you're studying the drug in patients who don't have high underlying risk, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be a problem. And that's exactly uh, entirely consistent with what we have said, that this is really only a problem to be concerned about in patients with high underlying risk. So in other studies where they're looking at patients with lower underlying risk, where they you know, the, the rate of MI is very low, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect this to be a problem to begin with. Yeah. That, that, was, that was my reaction too. I would have thought that a company, when it's studying a new drug, will be looking at generally healthy people who have low risk factors. Uh, and, and also that the, the, those studies are very short term. They might last 24 weeks or 48 weeks, whereas the DAD has been following people, in some cases, for up to seven years. And, and you know that's just that just reminds me how important it is to understand that this is not only a, a question about the size of the study, but mm -hmm. also how many events you have. The more events, how, the more people who's affected by the disease that you're interested in studying, yeah. the better you have to understand whether there is a problem or not. So if you study a lot of patients but they're low risk, you have few number of events, and therefore your chance of actually finding something is greatly reduced. We call it in science world. We call this the power of the study. How, 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 how what is the strength of the study to show an association? And if you have few events, you have uh, very little power. Yeah, there was a there was a comment in the uh, in the uh, the Lancet paper that addressed the uh, the GSK uh, research, and it was sort of one of the one of the points I thought was most important was, was it was saying the GSK data wasn't really powered. To exactly. find anything one way or another. That's so, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and uh, you know, that's just a uh, something that one needs to be observant about. If yeah. you do, if you're involved in this type of research, that you really, uh, the the studies that is important are those who have sufficient power to either show something, and if they want to uh, say that it isn't so, they need to have enough endpoints to really s have enough power to say that there is no issue. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's an issue, you know, that's a problem if, if the study don't have enough endpoints because then the power is, is limited. So, so, so in the registration of studies that Glaxo were doing with their own drugs, they really didn't see many heart, heart attacks and cardiovascular risks. So. But, but these studies were not designed to look at cardiovascular disease. They were designed to look at the viral, uh, HIV viral outcome. I mean, that's what they were designed to, they were designed to look at the, uh, and, and study the viral efficacy of the drug. Uh, and you know, uh, nobody thought about cardiovascular disease when some of these studies were initiated in 1995. I mean, there was no thinking about it. I mean, we're only discussing this in the last five years. No, and it's, and it's led to, to a whole new area of research that people wouldn't have considered a while ago. Which I think is important because uh, you know, HIV uh, populations are aging, and you know, cardiovascular disease is a disease of age. Uh, so, so now we appropriately are focusing in on this. So. Um, and, and, uh, and I guess as a practical reaction, it's led to a, a greater emphasis in guidelines and treatment guidelines for an awareness of your cardiovascular risk before you start treatment. Cardiovascular risk, yep. renal risk, yep. liver, you know, the, the, the whole gamut, right? Yep. I mean, we need to have all our body functions to function in order to survive until we are getting old. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to that because our, the drugs we're using may affect as it appears, yeah. depending on which we, uh, Us guys, we want to live for a long time, this is good. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we want to see that happen. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thanks very much, Jens, for taking time to go over the complications of this study. It's a really important.
Commission for Patients. Appreciate the Thank chance you. to Thank explain. You. Thank you.